Thank you, Richard. And welcome, everyone, once again. What a joy it is to uh, be at this time of the year. And uh, unbeknownst to me, I mean, I uh, knew that Kevin was probably would speak about change, but I also had a metaphor of a uh, river in mind <laughs> uh, speaking to you. And uh, unlike Heraclitus, I would say that I think we might step in the same river again. Um, so the answer is both yes and no. Um, so being a professor at Marlboro, being a teacher here over many years, I started in 2003, I feel um, that this time is very special. You have brought us the gift of your presence and through it, the gift of your enthusiasm and energy. And the image that comes to me in thinking about that is very much of a bubbling up uh, spring a riverhead, and it feels like the year at Marlboro is, begins at this riverhead with the bubbling of new energy and life that you bring us. And then slowly over the year, we progress downstream. And then after graduation, all the faculty we make our way back up to the <laughs> beginning again. And then uh, witness and experience the joy of welcoming yet another wonderful, beautiful, talented, and uh, class of uh, young people. Um, so yes, life has changed. We can't step in the same river, yet certain processes in life do continue. There's these enduring patterns that just keep recurring again and again. Um, and life changes just a fact of life. And we know that, but just like we seem to be suspended forever between our knowledge and our perception, right? I mean, I'm, we talked talk to some of you about this already, you know, how the world uh, is supposedly round, you know? But you ask a six, seven year old, they'll say, yes, the world is round. But then you ask them, what's going to happen if you keep walking for a very long time? And they'll say, most probably I'll fall off the edge. <laughs> so there is a relationship between our perception and our knowledge. And the both, both of them seem to be uh, sometimes uh, at odds with each other. And I think change is very much one of those. We know we're changing. Everything is changing. And yet certain changes seem much bigger than others. And I think. Uh, Kevin has talked about and Richard has alluded to one of the bigger changes that we are facing in higher ed and in Marlboro in particular. And that big change, which brings with it the unknown, brings sometimes a different set of challenges than the normal everyday change. And yet both are related. Um, you know, life is just a mixture of dealing with the unknown and right of known. And yet certain events seem so momentous that we don't feel like we're prepared for it or we don't know what are we going to do with some of the possibilities that we yet cannot imagine, or we're waylaid by the possibilities that we imagine too well, and of things not going our way. So because of the importance of these uh, big changes that are happening at Marlboro, we're in the process. All faculty during the faculty uh, um, advising session were asked to consider a question. <coughs> the first part of the, it was a two-part question. And the first part of the question was, how do you support yourself at this time of major change? And the second part of the question was, how do you support each other at this time? And for this few remarks, I would like to share my answer, a part of my answer to the question that was posed to all of us. And the answer is simple. It is by being curious, by cultivating our curiosity. I think that's the way we can support ourselves and also support others around us. Um, and to get to um, you know a uh, more expanded version of that, perhaps you can begin with thinking about how there's two primary ways in which we um, usually tend to react to things. We either close up or we open up to things. Right? We're either connected or we're disconnected. <laughs> and both seem to be necessary, as the idiom shows us that sometimes you know you go home after night, a long day's worth of work, I think, for some faculty. At this time, and for you guys, you'll say, I think I want to unplug. But well, how much more liberal can you get? You really want to disconnect from whatever you were plugged into. So both are necessary. You know? um, and this uh, dynamic of being connected and being disconnected, and having to navigate this motion. A um, great uh, Muslim uh, poet, somebody that I've worked with a lot, and respect and love a lot, Rumi, he talks about in a famous quatrain of his. <clears throat> First, the Persian. Rumi says, Imruz chuharruz kharabim kharab. Magasha dare andi che obargir raba. Sadgune namazas to ruku as to sujud. Anra ke jamal dust bashad mehra. Today, 
like every day, we are ruined, ruined. Don't open the door of thinking. Pick up a cello. There are a hundred ritual prayers, bowings, and prostrations for those who fix their eyes on the beauty of the Beloved. For Rumi, the Beloved is God, whose beauty suffuses creation, and hence he uses the symbolism of the Islamic ritual prayer of standing, facing Mecca, standing, bowing, prostrating, and doing it a number of times a day, as an image of talking about what life can be like when we connect to somebody. So prayer, in some ways, is the ultimate form of connection. And I mean, right now I'm thinking of one of the most extreme forms of prayer that we know of through Western literature, Western civilization, the prayer of Jonah in the belly of the whale. He had been swallowed in the whale. Imagine the darkness inside the belly of the whale. And in that state of depression, in that state of being cut off from the world, he calls out to God in the form of a prayer, which is in a song. It's a gorgeous song that is... Uh, uh, recited every year during Jewish ritual. So this reaching out through singing, that's what I feel Rumi is talking about. So, in a, from a religious perspective, you know, um, that movement, that connection can happen through prayer. And um, from a more um, non-religious perspective, perhaps call it a secular perspective, um, one might think of the values that we all hold in common. And one of the first things that you're going to have to do is to pass a clear writing requirement, right? How does this notion of reaching out, connecting, apply to writing? And I found the answer just a couple of weeks ago in this beautiful new book that has come out in writing by Joe Moran. It's called First You Write a Sentence, Reflections on Reading, Writing, and Living. And Moran recounts how writing for him, the making of sentences, is a way connecting with the world. Let me read uh, a couple of paragraphs from this. This is Moran. When I'm coming out of a dispiriting mood and feeling rejoined to the world, I start thinking in sentences again. I notice the ones printed on railway platform signs, <laughs> or the walls of train carriages, or bottles of pills, and roll them silently round in my head. Passing trains cause air turbulence. Please keep this seat available to those who may need it. If irritation occurs, discontinue use. Or as the words snap together, they link me in some small way to the faceless person, the mute, inglorious Milton who wrote them. This pencil is made with recycled CD cases. One sentence in a magazine ad I keep seeing, transform your existing staircase in just 48 hours, has started to read like a question on an exam paper. Sentences are strange, and the closer and more carefully you read them, the stranger they seem. I have learned to take this renewed interest in sentences as a sign that my mood is about to lift. The most reliable antidepressant is rekindled curiosity, and only the curious try to draw bits of the world together into words. The word curious derives from the Latin cura, which also gives us both cure and care. Curiosity is a cure for self-absorption. The cure being to care about the world and lay down roots in it again. Reading and writing sentences is a means of laying down these roots of achieving absorbentness. And to be truly absorbed in anything is to be blessed. It is this attitude of caring and curiosity as a cure for dealing with the unknown that I see as characterizing the farmer who's the character or the protagonist of that famous story about uh, change. So there was a farmer who had a horse, relied on the horse in order to till the lands, but the horse runs away. And the neighbors come to him and say, oh, what bad luck. And the farmer says, perhaps, let's see. A couple of weeks later, the horse returns, but the horse has brought with itself some other wild horses. And their jubilation in the village, and the people come to congratulate him. Oh, what good luck! The, the neighbors say, and the farmer says, Perhaps, let's see. The farmer's son, while training the new horses, taming them, is thrown off and breaks his leg. Again, you can imagine. No. The neighbors are there again, saying, Oh, so sad that this happened to you. What bad luck! And the farmer says, 
Perhaps. Let's see. And a week later, while well, the sun is convalescing, you know, it was pre modern times, the king's agents spread over the land and they're recruiting, drafting every able bodied man who can fight to be able to fight in a war that was probably that would be the death of many. And the farmer's son is spared because his leg is broken. He cannot go. And the neighbors come and see. Oh, what good luck. And the farmer say, says, perhaps, let's see. So what I find really great about this story um, is that this farmer is not simply somebody who's not doing anything about the change. He's engaged. He makes use of the opportunities that the change presents him. The horses are being trained. It's not like you know he's trying to turn the horses back. Um, so it's his perhaps, let's see, allows him to balance the ups and downs of the unknown and what they bring him in order to make the best use of it. Um, and this healing power of curiosity, staying open to the unknown, and hence not losing your balance when facing a misfortune or when facing good fortune, um, is really brought together, this healing effect and of paying attention, in a poem by Seamus Heaney that I'd like to share with you. And this poem came as a gift uh, a week ago. I was uh, talking to Catherine O'Callaghan. Is Catherine over there? Yes. And uh, I told her that I was going to talk about care, uh, cure, and curiosity, and she later sent me this poem, um, which brings it together beautifully. So I'm really grateful for this, and I wanted to share it with you as well. The poem is called The Wellhead. Your songs, when you sing them with your two eyes closed, as you always do, are like a local road we've known every turn off in the past. That midge veil, high hedged side road where you stood looking and listening until a car would come and go and leave you lonelier than you had been to begin with. So, sing on, dear shut eyed one, dear far voiced veteran. Sing yourself to where the singing comes from, ardent and cut off like our blind neighbor who played the piano all day in her bedroom. Her notes came out to us like hoisted water, raveling off a bucket at the wellhead, where next thing we'd be listening hushed and awkward. That blind from birth, sweet-voiced, withdrawn musician was like a silver vein in heavy clay, night water glittering in the light of day. But also just our neighbor, Rosie Keenan. She touched our cheeks. She let us touch her braille in books like books wallpaper patterns come. Her hands were active, and her eyes were full of open darkness and a watery shine. She knew us by our voices. She'd say she saw whoever or whatever. Being with her was intimate and helpful, like a cure you didn't notice happening. When I read a poem with Keenan's well in it, she said, I can see the sky at the bottom of it now. There must be many reasons, I think, for why Rosie Keenan is the kind of person whose company is intimate, comforting, and that helps heal and cure people without even the people knowing it. But the thing that really jumped up for me in uh, the battle with Patsy was Rosie Keenan's curiosity. The way she reaches out with her hands. She reads people with her hands. She reads books, the brails with her hands. It's the touch, it's the reaching out that curiosity. And somehow, her curiosity is a quality that she possesses in such abundance that it's a big part of her character and it definitely has to be part of what heals the people, part of what ends up becoming what is accumulation of her presence. And through this way of engaging with the world, a blind person is able to see a sky at the bottom of a dark well. So, whether this process of change that we're looking at, or other processes of change that you will most likely encounter in your life, appears as a dark well, <laughs> or as dark as uh, the belly of the whale in which Jonah was sitting. Um, I think that we can support ourselves and others at this time of transition, of transformation, through cultivating the practice of being curious. So rather than asking questions, that are meant to simply show what we know. Perhaps we can ask more curious and open-ended questions. Perhaps we can stay open like the farmer and accept what life has brought us 
Don't turn away from it. Try and make use of it. But be able to still say, perhaps, let's see. Perhaps when we're feeling cut off, we can be like Rumi and pick up a musical instrument and hence reach out with our voice. Something that Rosie Keenan also does. Or we can finesse our touch like Rosie Keenan. So that the touch that allows us to touch our own pulse, if you try and do that, is a very specific kind of touching that is required. It allows, asks us to balance pressing with being soft. Too soft and you won't feel the pulse. Too hard and you also squash the pulse. A balance has to be reached in this touching. And I think curiosity can do that. So I hope that we can cultivate this, this year, especially more than others, but throughout our lives. And perhaps we can be kind of, be the kind of people, and we can be kind of community, where people become comforted, a place that feels intimate, and they become cured without even them knowing that the cure is taking place. Welcome again to Marlborough. What a joy to have you with us.